Okay, good morning and welcome back to our Tuesday morning market outlook session. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. Again, I'm coming to you from my home in New York City. I hope everyone is staying safe, staying home, doing our part in helping us get past this so that we can get back to normal sooner and then later. So let's go ahead and get started today. What we want to cover is an update on where we are in the market, what opportunities we currently see as far as how to position yourself, and really what research we want to pay attention to as far as trading here goes. So before I get started, just a quick disclaimer, what I'm going to discuss here is purely for educational purposes and not a uh, recommendation or solicitation to buy or sell any specific securities. And I'm just going to start off by trying to help everyone answer the question that pretty much I'm sure is on everyone's mind, which is where are we headed next? And let's put this into context for those of you that are joining us for the first time doing these uh, morning out outlook sessions. I have covered this on our Friday morning outlook, but let's just go over this again. We've had about a 35% drop from the peak on February 19th. We've rallied back up roughly about 20% since then and we've sort of at this point stalled a little bit at this 262 level now what does 6262 represent 262 number one is the 20-day moving average on the daily chart um, there we've seen some some resistance here at this point it struggled to get past that level we've now bounced off it twice if we look at the hourly chart we bounced off of it once early last week I'm sorry, late last week, we bounced it off again today, where it looks like we're down uh, roughly another two and a half bucks on the S SPY. Um, so given the context of, you know, having three, four, five, seven percent moves every single day, you know, a two, two, two and a half percent, two and a half point move on SPY right now is, I would say, fairly quiet. We've seen the VIX pull back for the first time below 60, which is encouraging that stability is coming back into the markets. However, 262, um, we're already starting to see some of this rally fizzle a little bit. So as the markets rallied this roughly 20% from the bottom around 218, um, since then, what we've really seen is that despite continuing to try to break above that 262 level on the S&P, uh, momentum has continued to slow down. Um, so as markets continue to move, try to move higher, momentum has slowed down. This is typical of a rally that may have um, some trouble at this point. Now, if we do manage to break above 262, I do expect that we will make our way back up to at least 272, which is the next major resistance level we have here on the um, on the S&P, which goes back to, uh, you know, some support that we saw in the middle of, of this year. Um, 272 is actually the support level after the December 2018 rally. We, we reached 272 multiple times and bounced off of it. So that's the level that we really see a lot of buying here is around 272. So you have a lot of investors that are basically uh, long the market above 272 that when we get back above 272, we're likely going to see some selling. So that's really why 272 is such a critical level at this point for us to keep an eye out on. Um, so at this point, this rally has uh, stalled a bit here at this 262 level. And just to give you a little bit of context in terms of history, rarely do we enter bear markets like this and just make a V-shape recovery. So get back above 272 and kind of maybe get back to more of a bullish stance in the markets. Uh, the template that we currently see when we study history predominantly shows that when we do have this type of 20% rally, it's usually followed by at least another move to the downside. Now, you know, and, and this is really why we wanna to turn to some of the research to kind of answer, well, you know, yes, we may expect a move to the downside to perhaps test some of the some of the lows but you know is it going to go further beyond the 218 lows is it going to just test maybe the 235 lows and that's really where we want to turn to our research to try to answer some of those questions here today so you know just to put things into context you know we have the fed that has stepped in with a huge stimulus package both on the monetary and fiscal policy that it greatly exceeds what we um 
what we produced in 2009 during the financial crisis. There is a major difference between this stimulus and what we had back then is that this stimulus bill does come in at a far from a from a timing perspective far more um, quickly uh, before the recession really has hit, which certainly will help offset some of the damage. Now, the damage here is clear, meaning we have never seen anything of this speed ever before. If we look at the number of unemployment claims, this chart goes back to 1970. As you can see, even during the 87 crash, the financial crisis, we never exceeded roughly about 690, 700,000. And right now, last week, we had about 3.3 3 .3 million in unemployment claims, and this number is expected to grow. So, uh, however, despite all of this, what, you know, the sell-off that we had over the last couple of weeks predominantly was caused by two things. It was caused by the, uh, by us having a lot of unknowns, which now have been, uh, that, that now we have clarity on, such as the size of the stimulus package, exactly what the effects of coronavirus is in terms of trends, how it affects, um, you know, different countries, how it spreads. We have a lot of that data now. So a lot of the unknowns that caused this panic sell-off that was ex exacerbated by the lack of liquidity, that is now gone, which leads me to believe that even if we do get another sell-off to the downside, that we're not going to get the same type of violent sell-off that we experienced during this first initial push. So that's first and foremost. The second thing that I want to point out is the fact that um, the, any news that we get in terms of bad news going forward, whether it's the coronavirus spreads a little faster than we thought, or we don't have a, a cure for it as, you know, or, or any type of treatment for it, and it spreads even worse than we expect, that type of data is going to trickle in. That's not the type of data that's going to cause the same type of panic that we've seen in the markets over the last few weeks. So liquidity has improved a little, the data that's going to cause any type of negative downside, you know, whether it's economic data, whether it's earnings data that doesn't come in until really Q, you know, Q3 or so, where we really see the impact of, of the coronavirus, you know, that data is going to trickle in. So that type of news, if it does create some kind of selling pressure, creates downside, it's unlikely going to continue creating that type of panic. So I do expect that despite the fact that we are likely going to at least retest maybe the 235 lows is my expectation, that that type of process is probably going to be much more orderly, uh, maybe a more of a, a normal decline rather than just a quick, sharp uh, falling knife uh, is my expectation based on the current research that we have. So with that, some of the encouraging news that we have is that when Italy locked down their uh, total, had a total lockdown on March 9th, we saw the peak roughly uh, about, about 27, 28, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 17 days after that in terms of peaks, in terms of total new, daily new deaths, which is encouraging as a template for the rest of the world um, to be able to contain this by shutting down uh, their their cities if you will like uh, you know i live in new york we have pretty much had a, to a fairly total lockdown here um about a, a little over a week ago or so around here and this allows us to project out roughly you know how many uh, how this will spread how long it would take for us to contain this and we can apply this template to many other countries in the world that have effectively locked down their citizens. Um, you know, right now we have billions of people around the world that are effectively on lockdown, which as much as that would hurt the economy, it is good for us in terms of understanding the magnitude of this and also more importantly, the, the duration of this, which is two of the big unknowns that caused a lot of the panic sell off that we have a lot more data. So the good news is that a lot of the uncertainties that caused the initial sell off, it's they're now gone. The only uncertainty that we really have left is really the 
size and magnitude of the economic impact, which we also have some data to look at as well. You know, consumer confidence, at least here in the U.S., is really the big thing that we're trying to track because consumers make up about 70% of our economy. Um, so it's really important to try to get some data around how are consumers reacting to this? How much are they pulling back on spending? So consumer, I don't think it's a surprise to everyone that consumer um, uh, confidence has taken a huge hit. We've had the largest two week decline in consumer confidence and that number is likely going to continue moving lower. Um, but what we do have now is some high frequency data. So this is Bank of America publishes their daily credit card processing trends which is very which is relatively broad and rel and very high frequency meaning we get data every single day and if we look at the data it, it shouldn't come to a surprise for most people that the industries that are affected the most are your uh, airlines lodging entertainment and restaurants we've seen almost effectively a near a hundred percent decline in those particular categories because there are no flights that you can buy. No one's going to get on a flight. No one's going out to restaurants because they're all closed. So, um, you know, th this is the t this is the 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 areas of the of the economy that we're going to see the largest hit and will likely have a tough time getting back on their feet. Again, this should not come to a surprise to anyone. But you know, if we look at some other things, uh, what what's interesting is that you know. Retail, which again is a large driver of of our economy, you know, has seen has seen a pretty big hit in the clothing, furniture, and department store category, which is something that we're going to look at a little bit later in a few on the next slide, because there are some names here that that strike me as potentially that have perhaps rallied a little bit too far. That based on the data that we see have seen pretty big declines in terms of spending. Um, grocery having still uh, some decent numbers, I don't think also is a surprise to anyone that you know during the initial sell-off, a lot of people went out to buy groceries. That number seems to have uh, tapered off a little you know during this particular time you know we saw some pretty big spend on groceries as people try to make sure that they had enough food and groceries during this these lockdowns but that number has decreased substantially over the last couple of days um but online electronics interesting standout still strong at this point actually growing a little bit over the last a uh, few, a couple of weeks. So that's also another sector that I think we could focus our attention on in terms of where consumers are still spending their money. And then the industries that perhaps, you know, have not, whoops, perhaps that have not been hit as hard, uh, home improvement and, and, and retail, uh, surprisingly, not a huge hit. Um, home improvement, only 9%, retail, 17%. Um, Total car spend down 31%. So, you know, this just, this gives us a sense for kind of the magnitude of the decline. 31% decline in uh, total spend. So, you know, if you think about the pullback we've had in the market, roughly about 35%, and 70% of our market, uh, of, our, of our economy is consumer spending, that somewhat roughly lines up, right? You know, the, these two shouldn't, I mean, it's not a, certainly by no means exact, but, you know, the, the two correspond with each other relatively well. So, and what this tells me is that, you know, the markets may be overshot a little due to liquidity, but I don't think it necessarily pulled back too far. Um, so I think we've kind of reached a bit of an equilibrium based on the data that we have um, as far as where we currently stand. So again, to try to help you guys answer that question, you know, have we reached the market bottom? Is this a bear market rally? I think that we are, you know, if we're not near the bottom, we're close. And that 235 level is the key level that I'm keeping at support right now. And I think that as markets fall towards that 235 level, you're likely going to see a fair amount of buying down at those levels. Um, so that's what the current data current, uh, is showing us. So I want to take a look at, you know, what, you know, as people, as the volatility dies down a little, as 
liquidity starts to come back a little bit into the markets, giving you an understanding as to how we're currently positioning in the markets. So first and foremost, electronics and semiconductors are really a, a sector that we're focusing a little bit more on now, right now, as things stabilize. And what we're predominantly looking for are companies with strong balance sheets and cash. So two companies that kind of stand out at this point right now are Apple and AMD. If we look at some of the estimates for Apple, the top-down estimates for Apple, we're looking at roughly about a 15% decline in sales for Apple. The stock is down 20% or so. So we do think that there's a little bit more upside here in Apple, or at least not a lot of further downside here in Apple. AMD, semiconductor chips uh, per, for consumer electronics, has seen significant strength. Uh, I'm actually almost even a little surprised as far as where we currently are with AMD. AMD is actually back in 2019, uh, 2019 December prices. Um, so just to put into context, there's almost there's, there's very few stocks that are back in December 2019 prices. AMD is a standout here in this particular. Um, and I think strength and, and, and strong balance sheets are certainly – a, a place to consider um, uh, looking at for for investments if you're trying to look for what stocks should I buy for a bounce. Um, if we look at some of the consumer stocks, these have had a surprisingly strong rally off of those lows. And I think those rallies may fade. Looking at the, car, the card spend data, looking at where consumers are likely going to be here in the U.S. and more more importantly, globally, I think that some of the moves that we've seen in Nike, and Nike did a fit from a strong earnings announcement last week because the data out of China was a little better than expected, but it has recovered a decent portion of that sell-off. It's now roughly a little under 10% decline from its peak, and I think that this may have, in my opinion, be a little optimistic and perhaps it may start to fade a little over the next coming weeks as we continue to see more and more coronavirus fears grow globally. Because as I said, as I said, you know, even in the US, we haven't taken a unified view on on the lockdown. So there are states and pockets of the of the US economy that are likely going to remain on lockdown or have suffered. Uh, more from the coronavirus than they necessarily perhaps could have um, that they could have if they did have more of a full on lockdown as we're seeing some more pockets of that, like in New Orleans and in Detroit. Um, so, and noticeably, you know, as, as Nike has really has kind of continued to move higher over the last few days after that earnings announcement, momentum has really started to decline. And that's another telltale sign of a potential rally here that may be fading here. So some of the consumer stocks like Nike, Lululemon also had the very similar price um, uh, move. Lulu, not as strong as Nike, but again, one of these types of consumer stocks that I think um, may have some trouble over the next few weeks. Long term, do I think these companies are going to do uh, do well? Yes. I think out of the retail space, Nike, Lululemon are still standouts. But as a result of being a standout, I think they have rallied a little too far in the short run here. Telecom. Telecom is also another interesting one. If we look at you know 5G rollout and, and consumer focused pricing, T-Mobile really seems to stand out as the, as the new merger after Sprint um, against AT and T and Verizon, as they do uh, as they are more of a price sensitive uh, carrier. I think that as the global as as consumer confidence erodes, you might see more of a of a um, flight to a cheaper provider. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, telecoms is kind of like a utility; they're fairly interchangeable. Um, T-Mobile, with a very strong 5G rollout strategy, I think is likely going to see significantly higher growth versus AT and T and Verizon. That is certainly one of the standouts from, from our perspective. And lastly, 
energy and travel. This is a sector that I would stay away from because we continue to expect further weakness, not only in 2020, but we really think that many of these companies will struggle even in 2021 to get back on their feet. Many of them will not get back on their feet. Um, I think there will be plenty of country, uh, companies in the energy space that will have to claim bankruptcy, have to merge with other companies uh, in order to survive. Same thing in travel, whether it's because whether they need a government bailout to survive or will have to merge to survive, there will be casualties in both of these sectors, uh, again, not just this year, but going forward next year as well. And just to end this, uh, a quick note on liquidity. Liquidity is slowly making its way back we're we're seeing improvements pretty much on a daily level when i spoke to you here on friday there was only about 102 what i would consider liquid optionable symbols that we would trade normally that list before this major sell-off was about four to five hundred names liquidity actually was quite good it was improving um, before we got what uh, before we had the sell-off four to five hundred names is a pretty big list normally to trade that list is now only about 135 names. So, you know, we're still looking at about a third of that list of liquid optionable symbols to trade here. And you can find the list, that list at trade.optionsplay.com slash liquidity. So that is the outlook that we currently have in this market. Like I, like I have mentioned many times in, in my market outlook sessions, that things are moving very quickly. A little less quickly than we had a few um, weeks ago, right? But things are things certainly seem to be improving. A lot of the unknowns that we had that caused the sell-off have been removed. Uh, the unknowns that we currently have will kind of trickle in over the next few weeks, next few months, uh, perhaps even next few years. But you know, we don't expect the same amount of drastic change. Uh, so we don't expect more of the same panic selling going forward. Liquidity is, is, is certainly continuing to improve. Liquidity is a big factor in, in providing stability in the markets. The VIX has pulled back below 60. So we do still expect to see some further downside in the markets. But again, we think that at the current, mar at the current place where the markets are, we are fairly... Um, fairly priced, if you will. Again, things can get worse, right? The, cr the credit card data that I was showing you, things could decline further. And if that is the case, markets will likely decline further. But as the data that we have today with what we're looking at, I think the markets have reached a bit of an equilibrium and we're likely going to get some more sideways action here uh, between this 235 and 272 level. And then what we really want to focus on right now is individual stock picking, individual sectors. Many times when you're thinking about investing in this market, the best piece of advice that I have for you is use common sense. Think about industries that are less, inf uh, that are less um, impacted by the coronavirus versus industries that are more impacted by the coronavirus. Technology and cybersecurity is uh, is obviously a, a sector that is not going to be as heavily influenced by the coronavirus versus retail, travel, and you know energy prices. You know these are ones that are heavily influenced by the 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 coronavirus. So when you're investing, ask yourself you know that basic common sense question. You know, do I think that this is an industry that's heavily influenced, and that should help you get you know. Just, frame your mind as far as where do you want to invest? Where do you want to avoid? So again, I, I hope that this was useful for you guys in understanding what we're currently looking at, what research is important, what numbers we're looking at to help answer that question as far as where are markets headed going forward and where should you uh, invest your money going forward? So with that, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time out here this morning. I have a couple of minutes to try to answer some questions if anyone has any questions here. Um, so Microsoft bottomed. Yeah, a lot of prices have bottomed here. Um, I'm long CCL. Is that the the casino stock or is that the, the no, that's the CCLs, the carnival stock. So, you know, again, this is one of the industries that I would not touch because I think that not only, I don't think you're just going to get a quick bounce here. You see the same price action in this stock as well as you do in the airlines. 
you know, my favorite airline, Delta Airlines, is pretty much in the exact same state as Carnival Cruise Lines. I really think that this is an industry that I would stay away from because, again, there's really no indication at this point as far as when when people are going to travel, when the rest of the world is going to start traveling. And once you have some of that data, that's when I would start looking at this. You know, that, that credit card data that I've shown you really does not point to, uh, you know, an investment right now in these types of industries. You're basically seeing 100% declines across the board. Until that starts to improve a little, I wouldn't, um, you know, start looking at those industries just yet. Uh, the list you can find out here at this link, trade.optionsplay.com slash liquidity. Um, what about stocks involved in the coronavirus? You know, I, I don't know of any stocks that are really involved in the coronavirus other than healthcare stocks and pharmaceutical stocks. Um, everything else, I think, is more of a, uh, an indirect correlation to the coronavirus, like Zoom. Uh, Zoom video conferencing, a lot of the cybersecurity stocks, you know, as people working from home. Uh, some of the electronics uh, companies like Logitech, um, you know, where people are buying webcams so that they can work from home, uh, phone companies so that they can set up their, their, their landlines at home. There are a lot of these, these pockets of sectors that will, that will benefit, you know, Home Depot, Home Depot, you know, what's surprising is that home improvement is still fairly strong across the board. We haven't really seen any major declines in home improvement. Uh, I guess people are at home and they want to try to help. They they want to work on their homes while they're at home. So that is one of the bright spots uh, is home improvement and some of, even some of the um, uh, the health uh, the home builder stocks have been holding up pretty well. So again, thank you so much. I hope you guys have found this useful. I unfortunately have to run, but again, we're we're back here every Tuesday now to give you a, an additional update. I'm gonna keep keep you guys abreast of this type of data uh, to help you better understand how to position for this market. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great trading day and I'll see you guys next Tuesday.